Watchers in the Fourth Dimension. They are not people. They are things. They call. They murder. This is a fight to the death. To existence itself. Then, when we are out in space, and look back, you will see a vast, white, exploding planet. And know that they have died with it. Hello and welcome back to Watchers in the Fourth Dimension. I'm Anthony. I'm Don. I'm Julie. And I'm Riley. And I'd rather face the Chumblies than you any day. This episode, we're moving into season three of the show and deep into the wilderness of missing episodes. Speaking of which, there's been some exciting news today. Who's seen the news on the remount of Mission to the Unknown? I did. Do you want to tell us a little bit about it, Don? Apparently the BBC are adding to their YouTube channel this remount of Mission to the Unknown that some students put together. Yeah, some uh, some talented guys at University of Central Lancashire, or UCLan. Apparently they did it using 1960s techniques, uh, so it's as true to the original as they can be. They got Nick Briggs in to do the voice of the Daleks, and of course he does the voice of the Daleks in the actual show since 2005. Yeah, that means that we should actually be able to watch some live-action Mission to the Unknown next time round, which is exciting. Additionally, there's been some interesting Twitter activity on missing episodes. Mark Gatiss, the prolific writer, comedian, actor, a little bit of everything, general renaissance man. Local boy. Local boy. <laughs> <laughs> Hillary Briss. <laughs> He tweeted something along the lines of, it's about time that some missing episodes were found. And he gave a couple of examples, which were an episode of The Savages and an episode of The Smugglers. This is actually kind of significant because it ties into some hints from a gentleman called Paul Venezis, who is a renowned Doctor Who restoration expert. He's the first person anyone loops in when a missing episode is found because he's the one who coordinates all of that stabilization of the film, making sure it's in good condition, etc. And he had stated that he was aware of two episodes officially missing that were in the hands of a collector and that they had come from two separate returns, one from Australia and one from not Australia, which has allowed people to kind of guess which stories they might be from based on the timing. And those two stories fit what Paul Venezis has said around that. On top of that, Mark Gatiss was the person who actually announced the recoveries of, coincidentally, Galaxy 4 Episode 3 and The Underwater Menace Episode 2 back in 2011. As always, we kind of live in hope that where there's smoke, there's fire, and that we might have a couple more actual episodes to watch when we get round to them. On to Galaxy 4, and we'll get started as usual with our background information. This story was commissioned by Dennis Spooner before he stepped down as story editor, and was actually filmed as part of the second production block, but had been held over to Season 3. This meant that it had originally been written for a TARDIS crew that included, sadly, Ian and Barbara, and that to make this fit in continuity, their roles were combined together and given to Stephen for the story, which explains his somewhat uncharacteristic behaviour and why he wears a rather fetching cardigan. <laughs> <laughs> The story itself was written by William Ems, and this was his first and only contribution to the show. The entire cast hated his script. <laughs> And allegedly, and this I think was according to uh, Lawrence Miles and Tat Wood, things became so heated between the cast and the crew that the incoming producer, John Wiles, actually threatened to fire William Hartnell during filming. That's some good producing right there. Yeah, fire your star. And he's going to try and do that multiple times, just so you know. Originally, this serial was going to have been directed by Mervyn Pinfield, stalwart of the show at this point, but he fell very ill during pre-filming and actually died from his illness in the end. I think he died in 1966, and this was started in 1965. And he was replaced by Derek Martinez. Pinfield had actually been scheduled to direct the following serial, Mission to the Unknown, and Martinez was handed that as well. This meant that casting was already completed by the time Martinez showed up, and he just had to work with what he was given. He himself had been a director of the BBC Director's Training Course, and he'll go on to direct a total of six Doctor Who stories, including the first one in colour, Spearhead from Space. So we'll be seeing more of him. From a design perspective, we have first of four outings on the show for Richard Hunt, and he'll stay with us until season six. Outside of Doctor Who, he's quite notable for having worked on both Monty Python's Flying Circus and Dad's Army. Unfortunately for Julie, there was no music composed specifically for this story, and stock music by Les Structures Sonneurs was once again used, and, and this was the same stock music that had been used in the web planet. And so with that, it's time to move 
move on to discussing the story itself, and as usual, we'll be starting with a short summary, which, this time, is in the hands of Riley. The TARDIS crew arrive on a strangely quiet planet, only to discover a Roomba attempting to fuel up the TARDIS. Vicky, always wanting to name things, decides on calling it a Chumbly. Unfortunately, that Chumbly gets got by a Barbarella clone, and the crew are taken to meet this clone's cruel, vile leader named Maga. <clears throat> We discover that Maga is a Draven, and they are at war with the evil makers of the Chumblies, the Rills, two races, both of which have clumsily crashed on this planet and can't get their shit together to take off, which is problematic since the whole planet is set to blow in just two dawns. Eventually, the crew discover the Rills, who claim that it is the Dravins that are unnecessarily antagonistic and warlike. It's a classic Rill said, she said story. To wrap it up, it is Maga and her group of clones who are the evil ones, not the cooperative Rills, so the Doc helps repair the Riddle ship so they can take off, and the Rills help the Doctor and crew get past the Draven and to the TARDIS before the planet explodes by sending a sacrificial Chumbly to protect them. Simper Fi, little Chumbly. Simper Fi. <laughs> wow, when you put it like this, this story sounds extremely convoluted. You know, Riley, I think I can help with the convolution. This is a very simple story. Of a woman who would rather that her and her friends die than accept a ride from an ugly pilot <laughs> and his robot friends. <laughs> you are absolutely right. That is the end of the podcast. Thank you and good night. All right. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Shortest <laughs> podcast ever. Uh, so let's start with um, episode one, 400 Dawns. So I'm really sad that we're getting rid of Steven's beard. And then there's more grooming of Steven. And I'm just like, stop trying to make Steven clean cut. He's supposed to be just like this wild man. But seriously, Vicky knowing how to cut Steven's hair, really, stereotypes much. Right? I kind of wondered if that if she was supposed to be doing that for Barbara or Ian in the original script. I wonder if it was supposed to be mm. Barbara styling Ian's hair, given that she had previously done that in the Romans. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, good, possibility. good call. Good call. I found it interesting when the doctor was like, this is a scientific expedition. And I'm like, since when have any of these have been strictly scientific expeditions? <laughs> Since when? Yeah, we're we're a long way off from when the tenth Doctor just says purpose, fun. <laughs> yes, we're yes, still yes. trying to pretend this is science. However, in this episode, we do get what I think is my favorite Billy flub because I refuse to believe someone wrote it <laughs> that that I've heard. She said, maybe we'll get our, our long-deserved, undeserved rest. <laughs> he corrected himself with the yes. wrong word, and that was just, that was a good moment. Yes. <laughs> uh, speaking of weird things, once they get out, the Doctor comments that he's reminded of Xeros, the planet from the Space Museum. Because it's and quiet. And I'm just sitting there, yeah. I'm yeah, just sitting there going, good God, I hope this is a better story than that. <laughs> Okay, let's let's not go there because the space <laughs> Sorry, museum no. is much better than this garbage. But this one does have weird eyebrows as well. It does dot eyebrows, Bed bedazzled eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> and can someone explain to me? Like, I can't understand the naming of Chumbly because it moves in a Chumbly manner. I is is that sixties English slang that I'm not familiar with? Well, it's definitely not nineties or two thousands English slang. Yeah, it's it's probably, you know, like, you know, 24th century slang. Oh, yeah. I get it. Like, yeah. like, the, like the futuristic but, slang in Clockwork Orange. But on the flip side, Vicky pet name count plus one. Yes, yes, plus one. Plus one. I also like that Stephen goes for rocks for weapons. So the <laughs> doctor is already rubbing off on Stephen and, you know, rock is the weapon of choice. <laughs> So we have some nice little nods to the show's history. We have some 90s drag queen eyebrows. <laughs> some monsters with cute names. I mean, this is yeah. theoretically going in a really good direction, right? Yeah. <laughs> and did you notice the, the very stereotypical music that was used when the Draven were shown? Because it was like, yep, that is music that's played when women are on screen. Great. <laughs> To be utterly fair to the music when it wasn't doing that, I, I enjoyed the soundscapiness of it. And I like yes. the sound design for the Chumblies. Once we actually start learning about the Dravins, 
something occurred to me on this, and that's the Dravins reveal that they are the ones from Galaxy 4. So this story doesn't even take place in Galaxy 4. The, the title is Throwaway. Mm -hmm. This episode is called 400 Dawns. But the only numbers of dawns that were significant is 14 and 2, yep. if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. Whereas it, it, I think it later comes out the Dravins have been on the planet for 400 ah, dawns. Yes. So okay. the 400 yeah. dawns have already happened before we even get into the episode. <laughs> It's just a cool sounding title, really. That's they just want to make people look at the description and go, "Ooh, I'll watch that." Well, so are you, are you aware of Project MK Ultra? I'm kind of yes. wondering if yeah. William M's may have been spiked with LSD. <laughs> <laughs> I think this would have been much more delightfully weird if he had been. <laughs> I'm with you on that. The, the titles seem to suggest a lot of focus on the Draven and Maga in particular. Doesn't really seem to does doesn't seem to there to be a need of of a focus on on her or the drop and they each seem kind of just you know stock villains there's a structural problem when we meet them we're not supposed to think of them as villains they're supposed to be we're supposed to be very sympathetic to them because they're human and they're female and these terrible oh, no. monsters have brought them down and it's setting itself up to have a a good oh we learned something today about you can't judge creatures by their appearance and blah 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 <laughs> and the script completely fails on every level because MAGA is, is just so over the top. And so we never have yeah. any suspense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're right, because like, what's the first thing that she is like, you know, she's taking hostages, forcing them to go like take care of the rules for her. I mean, like that's like right off the bat. That's not what that's not what friends yeah. do. It's, it's not just that she's <laughs> I, evil. It's that she's stupid. Yeah. <laughs> if your plan is to take over the, the ship from the Rills and they have offered to let you on board, <laughs> go on board. <laughs> then you kill them. So what makes this even worse is from an audience perspective, all of the publicity for this story told the audience that the Dravins were bad. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, what? So even in 1965, they'd already ruined the surprise uh, going into this. Trailers ruining movies and television. Long, yeah. long story. What was also really sad is at first, because you know I didn't know that history of it, I was slightly going to be like, "Oh man, like this is exciting." There's like all these women, and then I was like, "All right, they're taking him to the leader. Is the is the leader a woman?" And I was like, "Oh, okay, they're all women." And then I was very disappointed because I figured it out like immediately. I was like, nope, MAGA's the worst. Uh, that just ruins my whole excitedness that could be like strong female characters that aren't terrible. And that's that's yeah. the big problem with it. it. It feels like you spend 400 dawns just waiting <laughs> for it to get on with it because you've already realized, OK, they're the bad guys. The Rills are going to be the good guys. Let's let's move it along. And it just doesn't. It would have been a lot more fun if it's so telegraphed that the Draven are bad and you're immediately, you know, based off of just, you know, cliche that you're expecting that the rules will be good. It would have been really funny if they got to the rules and the rules were just as bad. <laughs> and the Chumblies were the nice ones. That's the Aww. thing. If the Chumblies work for the rules, they're too cute for the rills to be evil you see them and you're like oh it's adorable you're you're not afraid so we learn a little about draven society so the warriors are grown the upper classes are actually birthed and female dominated most men are killed and others are just kept for purposes of breeding it sounds a little bit amazonian i mean obviously the amazons really just went with the route of we'll just leave our island go have sex and come back but it's kind of a similar idea death by snoo snoo yeah death de exactly death by snoo snoo yeah uh yeah and all through this we have hints that they're not actually as advanced as you might think so they haven't been able to destroy a chumbly their spaceship is kind of crappy yeah the doctor like that was actually quite of a funny little bit uh the doctor just is trash talking in the drop-in ship to quote, yeah. i don't know why that would just was a funny little bit to me to quote yet another cartoon it's not stupid it's advanced <laughs> And our heroes are suspicious of them pretty much from the get-go, particularly when they say, okay, you can go to the real ship, but one of you has to stay behind. They're like, why? I mean, it's yeah. just not subtle. It friends don't point guns and keep pointing guns at other friends. That's yeah. just not a thing. But guess what? We got the astral map back. 
Yes, that's actually was the one bright point outside of the <laughs> Chumbly design for episode one, the Astro Map. If I recall correctly, after we published our episode on the web planet, friend of the podcast Philip Cully tweeted us to remind us or to tell us even that the astral map would be back in this episode. So shout out to you, Phil. Hey, Phil. Thanks, Phil. I just said Phil. I think he goes by Philip. Sorry, Philip. <laughs> Uh, also i love the fact that not only did vicky you know name them chumblies but then i can't remember if she said it or i think it was in the um the script that was on the screen but it said that they that it chumbled off <laughs> as if chumble <laughs> was a verb it, is <laughs> it just made me very happy just before we continue on that note did everyone do the loose cannon reconstruction, or did anyone do the narrated audio? I did both. I just Ooh. did the reconstruction. Me too. The audio narration is so much better. Oh, oh man. man. Yes, it's better. So this was one of the earlier recons that was done, and dear God, it's like watching Doctor Who on VHS in the early 90s before they'd done any restoration on the early 60s stuff. <laughs> it's rough. It's rough. It's the going back and forth between... Some of it being still shot, some of it being, you know, live action and all that kind of stuff. And then I hate reading, like, on the screen when it has to do some description when it's still shots. And in the narration, it just, like, has this lovely man's voice. And he's just, you know, talking through it. And I'm like, ah, oh, you're a lovely narrator. Thank you. The voice of Pizza Purvis, a.k.a. Stephen Taylor. I found the audio hmm. on the Loose Cannon reconstruction to be incredibly difficult to listen to there was yeah, it, a lot of high-end noise and i had to really really focus to try and understand what bit of nothing was happening at any given point <laughs> in time so i promise they get better this is in my experience one of the ones with the worst audio by far they do get better but we'll see that as we go along we talked about the return of the astral map so that's when we find out that it's not 14 dawns before the planet explodes but two which brings us into episode two, Trap of Steel. This is where we find some even more interesting stuff about Drov in society, particularly the dietary habits of the soldiers. <laughs> <laughs> my God, by God. Wow. This is some First new off, use you're... of the word interesting I was previously unaware of. <laughs> <laughs> what I don't understand is if you're going to have soldiers who are, you know, I would think, have to be strong and be able to do physical conflict and everything. Don't feed them leaves. You need protein. So they're fed leaves and twigs. They get the crappy guns. Only Marga has the good gun. That was what got me. The crap you give your soldiers, your warriors, the crappy guns. And you, a leader who should be away from all the fighting, you get the good gun. But remember, they're dumb. She's smart. So obviously that's how it works. Really? <laughs> I can see why why he was never invited back to write again. Um, I love how well, love kind of not really. Um, <laughs> Vicky, <laughs> Vicky was like complaining about the whole like you know she's stuck there and all this other stuff. It was like, a, Vicky, you volunteered to stay behind. This was the instance where she had actually volunteered to stay behind. So I'm like, you have nothing to complain about, Vicky. You brought that on yourself. Maybe she's complaining about the hostage of the week element of yet another story. <laughs> but you know they share they share the load because you know she switches out with Stephen, which I thought that was one of the few things I liked about the script was that like okay, all right, have Stephen as like you know being held hostage. Or Vicky and the Doctor do some stuff. That yes. I like. That was fine. Yes. So do we think it was originally meant to be Ian or Barbara who was going to be held hostage second round, time oh, round? What do you think? I'm thinking. <laughs> I'm going with Barbara. Yeah. 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 The only way it would be more obvious would be if the cardigan had been a clean plot point <laughs> to her escape. <laughs> We also had the doctor saying that he never kills anything. And I'm like, well, how about all the times you tried to kill someone with a rock? Tried. That's attempted or murder, <laughs> not actual murder. <laughs> or just refusing to help the Dravins so they die on the planet. That's that's their problem. They should have left. <laughs> they were given an offer. <laughs> Plausible deniability. That sounds like a kind of ethical problem. <laughs> just because someone's an asshole, does it mean that you should leave them there to die? It's not a problem. I mean... <laughs> You know, it's, it's, that's the kind of thing that just resolves itself if you wait long enough. Uh, 
you know, this there could have been like a, maybe a better developed concept here. Like I keep thinking about, you know, how unnecessarily aggressive and antagonistic the Draven are. And I keep thinking of like that old fable of or the scorpion and the frog. And that I could have seen that kind of being put into this story and made it a little bit more interesting. But it never really develops more than that. I mean, there could have been a lot of yeah. things put into this. <laughs> So you know how um, John Oliver keeps referring to all of the, the Trump stuff going on as stupid Watergate? If you want to draw the same analogy and apply it to the scorpion and the frog, this is the frog and the stupid scorpion. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And one of the better things that I, I saw in this one was when Stephen was the one who was the held for ransom, whatever you want to call it, you know, the captive, whatever. He tried psychological manipulation and it was working. Totally. Because they're really dumb. And then, you know, Laga comes up and she's like, oh no, it's like, I know what you're trying to do. And I was like, ah, damn it. But then she tries to manipulate Steven. Poorly. And he's like, I'm not <laughs> falling for this shit. See, I could have sworn when you mentioned your, the good scene, I thought you were going to talk about Vicky's scene where she reflects the doctor's speech about observing and collating. And then I threw the rock because that was just brilliant. It was an awesome scene. Yeah. Yeah. That was a good scene. She's such a badass, like applying significant scientific method to try and figure out how to get around them. I love it. So we finally start getting in the direction of the rills. And at first they're kind of built up with this sense of dread, which doesn't really, and this may be the, fault of it being a lot of reconstruction or just i understand the concept they're going for and it was kind of I and mean, one car he was slightly lovecraftian like you can't see me because it would destroy your mind of how hideous and you know but uh you can like well i can see your top half <laughs> yeah kind of in a blurred way i thought they were just trying to cover for the fact they didn't have enough money to really sell it so like okay we'll build this we'll hide it behind some glass and it'll be fine i was expecting like a wizard of oz reveal i was i was expecting antony to say when we're moving in the direction of the plot not in the direction of the rills but <laughs> <laughs> one thing i got on this with the way that marga talks about the rills and i'm not the only one who says this i think this is uh sandifer if not it's it's wooden miles you talk about the analogies with communist propaganda Mark is talking about how hideous and bad and just terrible the rills are and when we when we meet them they're actually quite civilized their spaceship is nice in fact the doctor describes it as marvelous i think yeah the, the those maga followers believe those rills are some bad hombres it's uh it's the decadent west right that said, the one the one alarm bell for me, the, the real spaceship has the Dalek city pulse noise, the womp womp, womp womp. You know what I mean? That's very popular throughout the universe, this background. I was taken taken away by the the, the set for the real spaceship, which all I could think of was like a playground jungle gym from my childhood looking at it. I thought it was like <laughs> the garden center of the future, but that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> no. I definitely see that. So we end this episode with a real appearing, which in the loose cannon reconstruction was not well done. But again, it's one of the older ones. Which brings us into the only existing episode, guys. Episode three, Airlock. Exciting title. I know. I mean, it, it's such a generic title because of like, that's basically what we're going to do this episode. We're going to have an airlock scene. So we're going to call it Airlock. <laughs> And the airlock scene doesn't even happen until late in the episode. I, I feel like I the, the titling of these is terrible. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. I, and also, I'm I'm trying to understand what was the trap of steel? Was it the the real ship? Because uh, uh, I guess no. I think it might have been the uh, the Draven ship because I think that you know both Vicky was first you know held hostage there and then Stephen was held hostage there. It's a bit of a stretch. That's my best guess. <laughs> Could be, yeah. but back to Airschlock. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this episode was interesting. I I'm trying to recall. Uh, it uses a flashback. Oh yeah. And, yes. And does can anyone think of? any prior episode to this one having a flashback like this i think that's the first time that we've seen that with yeah, Doctor really Who. really struck with me yeah. an unearthly child we get the flashbacks oh, right the, the, to the, susan the, in the classroom yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Which one could argue that's more of a montage, a flashback montage, but this was like one specific scene, but yeah. Yeah, I thought that was really cool, actually, the way it was done. I enjoyed that as well. That is the third thing I enjoyed from the serial. <laughs> that flashback scene was surprisingly graphic. Yeah. There's fake blood, there's Margaret killing her own soldiers. Like, wow, that's not something I would expect from the BBC in 1965. I thought there were strict rules in place in whether or not they can show blood, particularly humanoid blood. I mean, that's surprising Maybe to me. Maybe she just tripped and spilled Hershey's syrup all over her face. <laughs> <laughs> and she shamed the warriors, so MAGA shot her. Yeah, the, the warriors saw it. Headcanon accepted. <laughs> <laughs> Aside from Marga wandering around looking like a fascist version of Dusty Springfield. <laughs> <laughs> been saving um, that one haven't you that's good yeah, i have <laughs> so once vicky gets captured we have a regression in the doctor's character because i don't know about you guys but where he decides he's gonna sabotage the air supply of the rills that mm -hmm. seems but he never kills like... anyone <laughs> it's the I mean, lack of a breathable that... atmosphere he had nothing to do with <laughs> that's something that would have happened two years ago but not right now <laughs> It's not me, it's just your fault that you can't, you know, breathe in anything other than ammonia, yeah. right? Hey. It was also one of those things, too, where, he, like, he was also struggling a lot with it, and I was like, Doctor, you know, you're a little, a little bit smarter than this. You should have, like, unfortunately, I would have been like, you should have had it done by now, but, you know, we don't actually want that to happen. But it was just like, do you want to write there, Doctor? It was taking him a while, and it would have been better if it, he was actually having, like, a moral quandary about it instead of just being confused. <laughs> Of course he was confused. He read the script. <laughs> As I sit here with some of the sets and I was just like, when Vicky was behind like the, the gate or whatever, I was just sitting there. I was like, Vicky, you can, you can crawl beneath the gate. It's, it's yeah. high enough. You could crawl. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> Damn it, Richard Hunt. <laughs> uh, yeah. So one of the things I really did like was the, the voices they gave to the Rills and the Chumblies, which actually, if I recall correctly, was kind of accidental. I think they used someone's voice who was going to be in Mission to the Unknown, so they didn't have to contract with an extra actor for it. And pinch those pennies. Which is super cheap, and I love it. <laughs> Well, I mean, I actually, that I did like the voice acting for the Rills. I really did. It did exactly what it needed to do because, of course, they're so hideous looking, except not really. They kind of look like kind of a aged job of the hut kind of thing. But, <laughs> um, but the voice, though, like did its job of like it seemed very like warming or non-threatening and kind of, you know, amicable. It, it could have been a lot worse. I think they would have, as yeah. we say quite often, would have looked better in the original black and white fuzzy screen. Yeah. Yeah. Watching it on a 15 inch screen or whatever it would have been. Yeah. So let's talk about Steven uh, get, getting some fisticuffs trying to take Ian's mantle. He gives that gives a good punch to a clone. But then he traps himself in an airlock. <laughs> <laughs> and, and OK, rather than go out and face something he's only been told is bad by his captors. He stays in there to either have to go back in with them or die from lack of oxygen. Right. His choices are get killed by MAGA, get killed by lack of oxygen in the airlock, or option three, see if that thing actually does want to kill you, even though it's... So apparently they don't teach game theory in his time frame. You say that, Riley, but he didn't actually have that third option because by the time that he oh, was right. given those options, yeah. that third option was taken oh, he, away. He took yes, too long to make up his mind if he'd just left. Yes. He had time. Oh, yeah. And of course, because we need drama, I use that term drama. very loosely. I'm so glad that this was Stephen and not Barbara because it would make me slightly disappointed in Barbara. It would oh, have. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I want to give credit to uh, the actor who played Maga. I did greatly enjoy the villainous grin she had when she w w there was a specific shot they give her um, when Stephen uh, when she I think realizes that or she in informs him that he can't go outside mm -hmm. now. He's really now stuck. And like I just I just like that grin she gave. That was that was good. It was a good evil grin. Stephanie Bidmead, the the actress, I think is 
the high part of the story. She's wonderful. She's wonderful. Like, her part is written so over the top that it's ridiculous, but she's wonderful at doing it. Yeah. They, they even gave her a nice little evil monologue. Yeah. <laughs> about how she can imagine them dying once they're far off and safe and all that stuff. <sighs> she's, yeah, she's definitely a highlight. But that wry little smile at the end, as she's quite clearly taking pleasure in Steven's predicament, brings us into episode four no it does no. not no. we were missing something cr crucially important episode three vicky and the doctor are on the way back and, and they have two chumblies with them and they run into a clone and vicky does something very very clever yeah she tries to convince the uh the dravins that she has control of the chumblies yes that doesn't go so well well no but she still does it that was so great it's like she has a good plan in order to trick the draven the other chumbly goes around the back and then what does she do she's the one that actually does the charge and the pounce and takes over and you know she you know wrestles the gun away it's good so these dravins they're just given that they're meant to be bred for war right so they're clone soldiers they're bloody useless they're sleeping on the job they're nearly <laughs> swayed by steven that's because they can't think well because they're only they're given no protein they're just given leaves or to diet eat. They're not really bred to survive. <laughs> Incidentally, in, in that little struggle for the Dravin's gun, the Doctor using his stick again, he's, he's back in action man mode. <laughs> All right, now can we go on to episode four? Another, with another generic title. The Exploding Planet. They should have given it like a little bit more flair and called this one, Thy Real Be Done. <laughs> Ooh, that's, that's, that's aiming that's a little title. high for this serial, but... <laughs> So after a real episode, we're back to recon slash narrated audio, and wow, it's jarring. Yeah. Was not happy with this at all. Yeah. So Maga actually does one smart thing, and you know, with with Steven, because she's she was like, you know what, it makes sense because he's a better hostage than dead. So maybe let's not actually have him die on us. And I was like, oh, you actually thought about that? Like, congratulations. That was. <laughs> Kind of impressive. In my in my notes for this particular episode, I think one highlight I have is, and I quote, Jesus Christ, this episode is painful. <laughs> <laughs> I really struggled here. I felt like this did not have enough material to fill four episodes in any way, shape or form. I felt like there was so much filler here in an episode that should have been the exciting climax. Wait, wait, you don't think the doctor essentially jump-starting a car is an exciting climax? Uh, <laughs> sadly not. Well, particularly not when it takes 24-ish minutes. <laughs> <sighs> but, and I don't know if I'm really giving credit here or just complaining again, we do have an inversion of a rather hated trope. Which is the, there's always one person who's like, well, I don't know if we can trust them, blah, blah, blah. Well, uh, yeah. here it's Stephen. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, Stephen, be... where have you been? <laughs> to where be... the hell have you been? To be fair, he almost, like, died, so I get it. But not at like... the hands of the Rills. <laughs> he died, he nearly died at the hands of the blatantly evil... <laughs> <laughs> antagonist and was saved but by he, the Chumblees and his friends but he doesn't but he doesn't yeah but i don't know that they really gave him sufficient background on the rules to real if they had had that scene that they talked about hey like hey here are the rules they're the ones who like really saved you because it was the Chumblees. i would have been like and Stephen probably would have been like ah cool lack of oxygen he's not thinking straight <laughs> are you talking about steven or the writer <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to comment. Porque um, no los dos. Uh, so we finally get the, it kick started. The rules leave, doctor leaves, and we just leave, you know, the dragons to just die. And don't forget, you know, the sacrificial chumbly. Oh. You know, uh, helps escort the doctor and the crew back to the charts. Yes, that was adorable. I really enjoyed the clearly made after the fact reconstruction scene of either when like the planet explodes i don't know if you guys watched the reconstruct you know, knows that scene the reconstruction it was live action and it was like this person 
with like the blonde wig and like shaking their hands in the air like why why <laughs> it was very enjoyable to me that was immense so while maga was over the top and a little bit ridiculous and not that smart i am kind of sad that she died on that planet because to a certain degree i think it would have been interesting to see her come back with with, a, with another writer yes yeah. with another writer yeah, yeah. <laughs> well the draven could still come back maybe they clone their leaders too so fun thing when i guess it was 10 years ago when journey's end aired 11 years ago so the the C- series four finale with Tenon, mm-hmm. and he goes off to see the shadow proclamation right you have the women mm-hmm. with the blonde hair yeah. in there so a couple of them were seen on set photos outside having a smoke and of course online fandom on places like gallifrey base went nuts thinking oh my gosh women with big blonde hair these are clearly the dravins <laughs> so for a brief while we were all convinced that the dravins were coming back here's about the dravins coming back i want the chumblies to come back yeah i would yeah, like the chumblies yeah. there yeah one thing i will say about this was i actually thought the direction on episode three the one we actually have was pretty good i really enjoyed that episode and i kind of wonder if the rest of the story might have been no. a bit more enjoyable <laughs> if we could actually see it um maybe a little bit but like when you think about episode two and one the way the show the the, the, the serial set up is that it feels like bottle episodes i mean we have two sets yeah we're either in the drop-in set spaceship set or we're in the real spaceship set and there's nothing else and like the scenes in between are just so barren without any really description to the planet i mean really the fact that they describe the planet as being so quiet while that is good to set up suspense in the first episode, later on provides absolutely nothing. Keeping in mind that this was recorded at the end of the second recording block, in which we had had three Richard Martin stories, and he was known for going way over budget. This was probably done on the cheap. I like how he wasn't even involved, and you find a way to blame Richard Martin for it. (laughs) 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 All right, So, we are left with a pseudo-cliffhanger, I guess, on, huh, I wonder what's happening on that planet below us, leading us into Mission to the Unknown, which we'll discuss next time. Uh, This is where we move on to our metrics, and with various departures, we are now down to just the Vicky pet name count, which, plus one. Plus one! Plus one for Chumblies, which brings us to a total of three so far. And the camp count. Any nominations for the camp count? I don't know. The Draven makeup could count as that, maybe. I was going to nominate the eyebrows. Yeah, yeah. The makeup, the eyebrows. Yeah. Let's do the the dot eyebrows. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which you know, that's that's not too bad. Next up, we move on to our scores. Julie, you get to go first this time. Ugh. Yeah. Sorry. Ugh. <laughs> Ugh. All right, so this wasn't great. The audio recordings were so much better than the reconstructions, so A plus on that. Plot is weak. I was really sad that the women weren't strong women that you could actually like rally behind, so that was disappointing. The chumblies may have saved the day, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to give it four dawns out of ten. For a minute, I thought you were about to say four dons out of 400 dons. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> get, Julie gives it point 0.1 points. I'm not sure if I like uh... being the metric against which this story is measured. I just want to point that out. <laughs> I'm a little hurt. <laughs> Riley, over to you. I don't think my score would have been any different with the, you know, if it was just the actual video footage and not a reconstruction because as we discussed there isn't much going on outside of those two sets so visually i don't think you're going to be missing much i mean i i mean maybe there was some i don't know interesting dramatic you know zooms and dutch angles or all these bottle episode like dialogue scenes maybe the design is decent except the script is literally feels like it was written in, in like an hour and like wasn't fleshed out like they have like a bare bones story and they just fail to put anything into it of interest it's it feels like utterly generic not offering anything interesting and it feels like a rush job i'll give it 4.5 ammonia bombs out of 10 
And that 0.5 is only because of the Chumblies. Without the Chumblies, it would have been a straight like four, if not worse. I'm up next. And honestly, I'm going to agree. This is, there's not a lot going on here. The moral of the story is so absurdly simplistic. I think it's almost insulting. I would like to see what it actually looked like. I think episode three looked a lot better than the recons did, but that's really not enough to raise it up. There are times that I was screaming at the screen, particularly at Steven for being such a dumbass. I, I just struggle to like this, and I can honestly see why the entire cast hated the script. It's so boring. So for me, this one gets uh, four leaves out of ten. <laughs> Done. It does leave you rather hungry. In addition to the other things that we discussed, such as the, once again, a hostage of the week, the obvious bad guys removing any kind of suspense that could have been built up. I also, and I forgot to mention this, really, really hated the moral shoved in at the end about, oh, not judging people by their appearance, not because I disagree with it, but because it was so shoehorned and unearned. Despite the fact that we can all agree that this is not a real good episode, pun definitely intended, there are a few things I liked. I liked the Chumblies. I like the sound design, and even though it wasn't written for this episode, I like the creepy music. The design of the Rill was good for what they had, and I liked that they tried to cover where it wouldn't have worked if they tried to show the full costume. Vicky and Billy had a couple good lines, but overall... I'm going to have to give it three unimaginable and unfilmable horrors out of ten. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, we have a new worst story. This is the first story to have a collective average less than four points. This was really bad in comparison to everything we've watched before. And I hope that's not a sign of things to come in this season, but we'll see. So... Before we call it a day, you'll know how we set up an email address and actually started publicizing it. Two different gentlemen dropped us notes, Bill Lemond and Thomas Meehan. They were both kind enough to drop us emails after our episode on The Chase went out, which at the time of, of recording was the last one that was actually released. We have a, a little bit of a lag between recording and release. Bill wrote to us to agree that The Chase was very fun trash to watch. <laughs> <laughs> So he basically agreed with our group assessment. And Thomas wrote to tell us how much he's enjoying the podcast and to ask whether, when we eventually get there, whether we'll be covering any of the spin-offs. Well, Thomas, we're still quite a long way away from that, and we will figure out what to do with those when we get there. In the meantime, if you want to email us, you can reach us at watchers4d at gmail.com. We'll be back next time to discuss the only Doctor Who story not to feature any of the regular cast, Missions to the Unknown. In the meantime, our previous episodes are all available on your favourite podcasting app, and you can interact with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at watchers 4 d And as another reminder, you can email us at watchers 4 d at gmail.com. Thank you very much for listening, and have a good one. You have been listening to Watchers in the Fourth Dimension with Don Smith, Riley Shrek, Julie Philippek, and myself, Anthony Williams. This episode, a fascist version of Dusty Springfield, was recorded on Wednesday the 11th of September 2019. And always remember, cardigans are cool. Barbara told you so, and now Stephen is also telling you so.